The Invisible Man by H. G. Wells Chapter 23 In Drury Lane But you begin now to realise, said the Invisible Man, the full disadvantage of my condition. I had no shelter, no covering. To get clothing was to forego all my advantage, to make myself a strange and terrible thing. I was fasting, for to eat, to fill myself with unassimilated matter, would be to become grotesquely visible again. I never thought of that, said Kemp. Nor had I, and the snow had warned me of other dangers. I could not go abroad in snow, it would settle on me and expose me. Rain, too, would make me a water outline, a glistening surface of a man, a bubble. And fog, I should be like a fainter bubble in a fog, a surface, a greasy glimmer of humanity. Moreover, as I went abroad in the London air, I gathered dirt about my ankles, floating smuts and dust upon my skin. I did not know how long it would be before I should come visible from that cause also. But I saw clearly it could not be for long, not in London at any rate. I went into the slums towards Great Portland Street and found myself at the end of the street in which I had lodged. I did not go that way because of the crowd halfway down it, opposite still looking at the smoking ruins of the house I had fired. My most immediate problem was to get clothing. What to do with my face puzzled me. Then I saw one of those little miscellaneous shops, news, sweets, toys, stationery, belated Christmas tomfoolery and so forth, an array of masks and noses. I realised the problem was solved. In a flash I saw my course. I turned about, no longer aimless, and went, circuitously, in order to avoid the busy ways, towards the back streets north of the Strand for I remembered, though not very distinctly where, that some theatrical costumiers had shops in that district. The day was cold, with a nipping wind down the northward running streets. I walked fast to avoid being overtaken. Every crossing was a danger, every passenger a thing to watch alertly. One man I was about to pass him at the top of Bedford Street, turned upon me abruptly and came into me, sending me into the road and almost under the wheel of a passing hansom. The verdict of the cab rank was that he had some sort of stroke. I was so unnerved by this encounter that I went into Covent Garden Market and sat down for some time in a quiet corner by a stall of violets, panting and trembling. I found I had caught a fresh cold and had to turn out after time lest my sneezes should attract attention. At last I reached the object of my quest, a dirty, fly-blown little shop in a byway near Drury Lane with a window full of tinsel robes, sham jewels, wigs, slippers, dominoes, and theatrical photographs. The shop was old-fashioned and low and dark, and the house rose above it for four stories, dark and dismal. I peered through the window, and seeing no one within, entered. The opening of the door set a clanking bell ringing. I left it open and walked around a bare costume stand into a corner behind a cheval glass. For a minute or so no one came. Then I heard heavy feet striding across a room, and a man appeared down the shop. My plans were now perfectly definite. I proposed to make my way into the house, secrete myself upstairs, watch my opportunity, and when everything was quiet, rummage out a wig, mask, spectacles, and costume, and go into the world, perhaps a grotesque, but still a credible figure. And incidentally, of course, I could rob the house of any available money. The man who had just entered the shop was a short, slight, hunched, beetle-browed man, with long arms and very short bandy legs. Apparently I had interrupted a meal. He stared about the shop with an expression of expectation. This gave way to surprise, and then to anger as he saw the shop empty. "'Damn the boys,' he said. He went to stare up and down the street. He came in again in a minute, kicked the door to with his foot spitefully, and went muttering back to the house door. I came forward to follow him, and at the noise of my movement he stopped dead. I did so too, startled by his quickness of ear. He slammed the house door in my face. I stood hesitating. Suddenly I heard his quick footsteps returning, and the door reopened. He stood looking about the shop like one who was still not satisfied. Then, murmuring to himself, he examined the back of the counter and peered behind some fixtures. Then he stood doubtful. He had left the house door open, and I slipped into the inner room. It was a queer little room, poorly furnished, and with a number of big masks in the corner. On the table was his belated breakfast, and it was confoundedly exasperating for me, Kemp, to have to sniff his coffee and stand watching while he came in and resumed his meal. 
and his table manners were irritating. Three doors opened into the little room, one going upstairs and one down, but they were all shut. I could not get out of the room while he was there. I could scarcely move because of his alertness, and there was a draught down my back. Twice I strangled a sneeze just in time. The spectacular quality of my sensations was curious and novel, but for all that I was heartily tired and angry long before he had done his eating. But at last he made an end, and putting his beggarly crockery on the black tin tray upon which he had had his teapot, and gathering all the crumbs up on the mustard-stained cloth, he took the whole lot of things after him. His burden prevented his shutting the door behind him, as he would have done. I had never seen such a man for shutting doors, and I followed him into a very dirty underground kitchen and scullery. I had the pleasure of seeing him begin to wash up, and then, finding no good in keeping down there, and the brick floor being cold on my feet, I returned upstairs and sat in his chair by the fire. It was burning low, and scarcely thinking I put on a little coal. The noise of this brought him up at once, and he stood a glare. He peered about the room and was within an ace of touching me. Even after that examination he scarcely seemed satisfied. He stopped in the doorway and took a final inspection before he went down. I waited in the little parlour for an age, and at last he came up and opened the upstairs door. I just managed to get by him. On the staircase he stopped suddenly, so that I very nearly blundered into him. He stood looking right back into my face and listening. I could have sworn, he said. His long hairy hand pulled at his lower lip. His eye went up and down the staircase. Then he grunted and went on up again. His hand was on the handle of a door, and then he stopped again with the same puzzled anger on his face. He was becoming aware of the faint sounds of my movements about him. The man must have had diabolically acute hearing. He suddenly flashed into rage. "'If there's anyone in this house,' he cried with an oath, and left the threat unfinished. He put his hand in his pocket, failed to find what he wanted, and rushing past me went blundering noisily and pugnaciously downstairs. But I did not follow him. I sat on the head of the staircase until his return. Presently he came up again, still muttering. He opened the door of the room, and before I could enter, slammed it in my face. I resolved to explore the house, and spent some time in doing it so as noiselessly as possible. The house was very old and tumble-down, damp so that the paper in the attics was peeling from the walls, and rat-infested. Some of the door-handles were stiff, and I was afraid to turn them. Several rooms I did inspect were unfurnished, and others were littered with theatrical lumber, bought second-hand, I judged, from its appearance. In one room next to his I found a lot of old clothes. I began rooting among these, and in my eagerness forgot again the evident sharpness of his ears. I heard a stealthy footstep, and, looking up just in time, saw him peering in at the tumbled heap and holding an old-fashioned revolver in his hand. I stood perfectly still while he stared about open-mouthed and suspicious. It must have been her, he said slowly, damn her. He shut the door quietly, and immediately I heard the key turn in the lock. Then his footsteps retreated. I realised abruptly that I was locked in. For a moment I did not know what to do. I walked from door to window and back, and stood perplexed. A gust of anger came upon me. But I decided to inspect the clothes before I did anything further, and my first attempt brought down a pile from an upper shelf. This brought him back, more sinister than ever. That time he actually touched me, jumped back with amazement, and stood astonished in the middle of the room. Presently he calmed a little. "'Rats,' he said in an undertone, fingers on lips. He was evidently a little scared. I edged quietly out of the room, but a plank creaked. Then the infernal little brute started going all over the house, revolver in hand, and locking door after door and pocketing the keys. When I realised what he was up to, I had a fit of rage. I could hardly control myself sufficiently to watch my opportunity. By this time I knew he was alone in the house, and so I made no more ado but knocked him on the head. "'Knocked him on the head?' exclaimed Kemp. Yes, stunned him, as he was going downstairs. Hit him from behind with a stool that stood on the landing. He went downstairs like a bag of old boots. But, I say, the common conventions of humanity are all very well for common people, 
but the point was, Kemp, that I had to get out of that house in a disguise without his seeing me, and I couldn't think of another way of doing it. And then I gagged him with a Louis XIV vest and tied him up in a sheet. Tied him up in a sheet? I made a sort of bag of it. It was rather a good idea to keep the idiot scared and quiet, and a devilish hard thing to get out of. Head away from the string. My dear Kemp, it's no good you sitting glaring at me as though I was a murderer. It had to be done. He had his revolver. If once he saw me, he would be able to describe me. But still, said Kemp, in England, today, and the man was in his own house, and you were, well, robbing. Robbing? Confound it, you'll call me a thief next. Surely, Kemp, you're not fool enough to dance on the old strings. Can't you see my position? And his too, said Kemp. The invisible man stood up sharply. What do you mean to say? Kemp's face grew a trifle hard. He was about to speak and checked himself. I suppose after all, he said with a sudden change of manner, the thing had to be done. You were in a fix. But still, of course I was in a fix, an infernal fix. And he made me wild too, hunting me about the house, fooling about with his revolver, locking and unlocking doors. He was simply exasperating. You don't blame me, do you? You don't blame me? I never blame anyone, said Kemp. It's quite out of fashion. What did you do next? I was hungry. Downstairs I found a loaf and some rank cheese, more than sufficient to satisfy my hunger. I took some brandy and water, and then went up past my impromptu bag. He was lying quite still, to the room containing the old clothes. This looked out upon the street, two lace curtains, brown with dirt, guarding the window. I went and peered out through their interstices. Outside the day was bright, by contrast with the brown shadows of the dismal house in which I found myself, dazzlingly bright. A brisk traffic was going by, fruit carts, a hansom, a four-wheeler with a pile of boxes, a fishmonger's cart. I turned with spots of colour swimming before my eyes to the shadowy fixtures behind me. My excitement was giving place to a clear apprehension of my position again. The room was full of a faint scent of benzoline, used, I suppose, in cleaning the garments. I began a systematic search of the place. I should judge the hunchback had been alone in the house for some time. He was a curious person. Everything that could possibly be of service to me I collected in the clothes storeroom. Then I made a deliberate selection. I found a handbag I thought a suitable possession, and some powder, rouge, and sticking plaster. I had thought of painting and powdering my face, and all that there was to show of me, in order to render myself visible but the disadvantage of this lay in the fact that I should require turpentine and other appliances, and a considerable amount of time before I could vanish again. Finally, I chose a mask of the better type, slightly grotesque, but not more so than many human beings. Dark glasses, greyish whiskers, and a wig. I could find no underclothing, but that I could buy subsequently, and for the time I swathed myself in calico dominoes and some white cashmere scarves. I could find no socks, but the hunchback's boots were rather a loose fit, and sufficed. In a desk in the shop were three sovereigns and about thirty shillings worth of silver, and in a locked cupboard I burst in in the inner room were eight pounds in gold. I could go forth into the world again, equipped. Then came a curious hesitation. Was my appearance really credible? I tried myself with a little bedroom looking-glass, inspecting myself from every point of view to discover any forgotten chink, but it all seemed sound. I was grotesque to the theatrical pitch, a stage miser, but I was certainly not a physical impossibility. Gaining confidence, I took my looking-glass down into the shop, pulled down the shop blinds, and surveyed myself from every point of view with the help of the cheval-glass in the corner. I spent some moments screwing up my courage, and then unlocked the shop door and marched out into the street, leaving the little man to get out of his sheet again when he liked. In five minutes a dozen turnings intervened between me and the costumier's shop. No one appeared to notice me very pointedly. My last difficulty seemed overcome. He stopped again. "'And you troubled no more about the hunchback?' said Kemp. "'No,' said the invisible man. "'Nor have I heard what became of him. I suppose he untied himself or kicked himself out. The knots were pretty tight.' He became silent and went to the window and stared out. What happened when you went out into the Strand? Oh, disillusionment again. I thought my troubles were over. 
Practically, I thought I had impunity to do whatever I chose, everything, save to give away my secret. So I thought. Whatever I did, whatever the consequences might be, was nothing to me. I had merely to fling aside my garments and vanish. No person could hold me. I could take my money where I found it. I decided to treat myself to a sumptuous feast, and then put up at a good hotel and accumulate a new outfit of property. I felt amazingly confident. It's not particularly pleasant recalling that I was an ass. I went into a place and was already ordering lunch when it occurred to me that I could not eat unless I exposed my invisible face. I finished ordering the lunch, told the man I should be back in ten minutes, and went out exasperating. I don't know if you've ever been disappointed in your appetite. Not quite so badly, said Kemp, but I can imagine it. I could have smashed the silly devils. At last, faint with the desire for tasteful food, I went into another place and demanded a private room. I am disfigured, I said, badly. They looked at me curiously, but of course it was not their affair, and so at last I got my lunch. It was not particularly well served, but it sufficed, and when I had it I sat over a cigar, trying to plan my line of action. And outside a snowstorm was beginning. The more I thought it over, Kemp, the more I realised what a helpless absurdity an invisible man was, in a cold and dirty climate and a crowded civilised city. Before I made this mad experiment I had dreamt of a thousand advantages. That afternoon it seemed all disappointment. I went over the heads of the things a man reckons desirable. No doubt invisibility made it possible to get them, but it made it impossible to enjoy them when they are got. Ambition. What is the good of pride of place when you cannot appear there? What is the good of the love of a woman when her name must needs be Delilah? I have no taste for politics, for the blackguardisms of fame, for philanthropy, for sport. What was I to do? And for this I had become a wrapped-up mystery, a swathed and bandaged caricature of a man. He paused, and his attitude suggested a roving glance at the window. "'But how did you get to Iping?' said Kemp, anxious to keep his guest busy talking. I went there to work. I had one hope. It was a half-idea. I have it still. It is a full-blown idea now, a way of getting back, of restoring what I have done. When I choose. When I have done all I mean to do invisibly. And that is what I chiefly want to talk to you about now. You went straight to Iping? Yes. I had simply to get my three volumes of memoranda and my checkbook, my luggage and underclothing, order a quantity of chemicals to work out this idea of mine. I will show you the calculations as soon as I get my books. And then I started. Jove! I remember the snowstorm now and the accursed bother it was to keep the snow from damping my pasteboard nose. At the end, said Kemp, the day before yesterday when they found you out, you rather, to judge by the papers, I did, rather. Did I kill that fool of a constable? No, said Kemp, he's expected to recover. That's his luck, then. I clean lost my temper, the fools. Why couldn't they leave me alone? And that grocer lout? There are no deaths expected, said Kemp. I don't know about that tramp of mine, said the invisible man with an unpleasant laugh. By heaven, Kemp, you don't know what rage is. To have worked for years, to have planned and plotted, and then to get some fumbling purblind idiot messing across your course. Every conceivable sort of silly creature that has ever been created has been sent to cross me. If I have much more of it, I shall go wild. I shall stop mowing them. As it is, they've made things a thousand times more difficult. No doubt it's exasperating, said Kemp, dryly. End of chapter 23 Recorded in Nottingham, England on the 11th of April 2006 by alexfoster.me.uk